Good evening. It is good to see all of you here. I, uh, Tim and I were just discussing the accuracy of that clock. And, uh, and he's like, oh, I can go now. And I realized I'm up first. So good evening. And uh, I hope I'm not forgetful for the rest of the service. Uh, there are a number of announcements we covered this morning. Uh, thankfully, quite a bit happened this morning, so we don't have to get through all of them. But there are a lot of important things uh, that are coming up this weekend and next week uh, that we need you to sign up for if you're going to be involved, because they include uh, counting attendance and whatnot. Um, the first would be the parade this Saturday, uh, the 3rd of July, uh, that we are going to meet here in carpool uh, to the fairgrounds. The step-off for the parade float is at 4. Uh, so if you'd like to help us carry our flag that we carry every year, except last year, uh, please do so. The sign-up is over there. We need 16 people. We only have about 13. So uh, John will be heading that up, but you can see him and I for questions. I was asked, hey, what if you don't want to carpool? And then you can follow the van there uh, by meeting here at 3.30 still. Um, oh, but if not, we will get you the gate information and time and put it out by Wednesday evening. Also, the next day, July 4th, will be our uh, Deacon's Agape lunch. All, everyone is invited to that, but we do ask that you sign up so they can uh, purchase enough meat and cook. I don't know who's cooking. I forgot to ask about that. But if it's John or Ross, we're in good hands. So uh, they'd love to have you here and celebrate our, uh, our country and our, our fellowship here as, as Christians that afternoon. And there won't be any uh, evening service that Sunday either. Uh, then I also announced that the next week BMM is going to be meeting their annual family conference and they've asked us to help get workers for watching children. If you are free that week and you would be interested in driving out to Lyria a couple days or once, uh, please uh, call them or call the office this week so we can get you uh, lined up. I don't believe there's a sign up for that out there, uh, but they are still in need of child care and that is an important ministry as all of the missionaries from uh, as many can from around the world come back for family conference. The tenth is uh, Faith Baptist Community Church Center's uh, fun day. Now the Vanix, I said this this morning, but the Vanix and the other uh, missionaries from that ministry are going to be our VBS missionaries this year. We always have a VBS missionary. And uh, that is the 12th to the 16th, but they are having their own and they asked for some help uh, running it, doing some PR. So if you can do that, please call Jackie Hopkins or the center or our staff this week. That is the 10th, the Saturday before VBS. And then, of course, our uh, July uh, emphasis, the VBS here for all ages, three through three on and up. Even Thang can come. I know uh, we, we looked at doing three to 99, but we thought that was uh, ageist because, you know, anybody over 99 wouldn't be able to come. So it is three on and up. So if you uh, know anyone who can come, we have online registrations this year or they can call the office. And you know that number. And the flyers are out there on the other uh, table that is not the Welcome Center if you want to give people a paper invitation. Uh, I believe that is all. Uh, and uh, one thing I neglected to say this morning was there has been a host of new books uh, approved by the committee uh, that are now in the library. There's actually a list on the Welcome Center also of those. I think it's about a dozen. Uh, so we always update those works. This is one of the most active church libraries I've seen in a really long time. So avail yourself of that. I'm always borrowing commentaries from there, and it's, uh, it's very useful. I have uh, one other announcement uh, that I need to make this evening. Pastor Spink called me on the way here, and um, it is uh, sobering, but uh, Brother Phil Kimes has passed away uh, shortly after the morning service, I understand. Um, I don't know much else. Uh, obviously, uh, there we, uh, we are still grieving with Betty Riley over Mark this last week, and uh, Pastor shared that information this morning. But uh, details about Brother Kimes' arrangements will be forthcoming uh, through mail or email or the, the phone. So just pray for um, the family, pray for the arrangements that uh, God would continue to be honored, and, and praise God that there is another um, soul in heaven today, and we can rejoice with him in that. Uh, so without further ado, Tim, come on up. Good evening. I didn't believe my brother when he said he was providing the prelude this evening, but it sounded really good. Good job. <laughs> Let's all stand together, sing uh, praise to the Lord Almighty. I was going to say 210, but I guess we still don't have hymnals in the pews. So it's praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Mm -hmm. 
much for this evening as we continue our worship of you uh, in singing, and praise, and honoring your name. Pray that our words would be uh, genuine, that our hearts would be humble as uh, everything else that is cluttering our minds uh, today would uh, be put on pause, put to rest for the moment as we take solace in your presence, your spirit's involvement, and as we uh, continue to honor you through our own gifts and talents. I pray that uh, you would accept them as, uh, as crowns thrown at your feet, Lord, and continue to be with us in this place this evening as we, we uh, sing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. I'll sing, My Hope is in the Lord. <clears throat> of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he Father 
two other people, uh, but one of them is under the weather. So I have the privilege of talking about the Snells this evening, who I know are dear to our hearts for specific, more specific reasons than just being missionaries. Uh, and this letter is from their uh, June month, so it's very recent. It says, Dear Praying Friends, we are all set to have our church founding service on June 20th. That was last week. In preparation for the event, we've had all of the charter members give their testimonies over the last several weeks. It has been a blessing to hear each one's story of salvation and how God has worked in his or her life. Please continue to pray for this special service and the four, for the four individuals who will be baptized that day as well. Please pray for our family and our church who has COVID. They are recovering slowly, but we are not sure if they will be well enough to make it to the founding service. Please pray that they will be fully recovered and able to be out of quarantine in time to participate. We're also excited to have Christopher Sedd with us for the next six weeks as he completes an intensive internship for his missions program at Faith Baptist Bible College. Please pray for him as he learns about missions in Germany and seeks God's will for his future. We're also excited to announce that we will be gaining new teammates at the end of the summer. Caleb and Missy Metzger and their three children will be joining us in August to assist in the ministry here in Ingelheim. They are BMM missionaries who have just completed their language program requirements and are ready to jump into ministry. Please pray for them as they go through the process of moving to a new city, new school, and new church. We are thankful for you, our prayer warriors, Luke, Bethany, Judah, and Isaiah Snell. And uh, even though it was last week, uh, I heard that went well, and uh, it sounds like they packed a lot into one day. You guys know how busy uh, baptismal services are here. Um, and knowing that a church goes through a founding uh, ceremony and service is so refreshing. It means the church has decided to be uh, plant itself officially, be independent and autonomous, and, uh, and Luke and Bethany, we know, are wonderful people to assist them in that and lead them. So let's go to prayer for our brothers and sisters overseas before God. Lord, I again pray uh, with this congregation, these people, Lord, as we come together tonight and think of the Snells, and we know them well, and we just thank you for all you've done in their life the last three or four years uh, in, with the new ministry and uh, moving there and having the boys, and we thank you for the ministry in Ingelheim and Luke's work with that and how he, uh, he's gotten to the point where uh, they wanted to have a founding service and I pray, I thank you for each one of those charter members that they take their commitment seriously and that they take the, their signatures on their uh, documents seriously as we ought to all take our spiritual growth seriously. Lord, I thank you that um, the church itself is uh, mostly healthy. I pray for this family that is uh, still struggling from COVID when this letter was written on the 3rd and uh, that they were able to go to the service um, as it is a very special uh, once-in-a-lifetime event. And uh, we thank you that um, they have been able to have an intern uh, there. It is refreshing to see young people learn, and especially in a, in, a, in a specific context. And I pray that uh, Christopher would be able to uh, decide if, if he would uh, like to seek missions with the rest of his life. Lord, please lead him and, uh, and his, his gifts. 
Thank you that the uh, Metzgers are going to be able to go over and serve in Ingelheim. And I don't, uh, I don't believe I've met them, but it is refreshing to have partners in ministry uh, to keep you accountable, to keep you encouraged, and uh, to, of course, assist in as many ways as possible. Thank you for BMM and, and their burden for Germany and for the Snell's burden for Germany. And I pray that you will continue to uplift and uphold uh, Luke and Bethany. In Jesus' name. Can we stand one last time this evening? We'll sing chorus, God Will Make a Way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Special music, please be seated.
promises and by faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. I told the teens every month that it would be a quartet. I don't think anyone would show up. Quintet, excuse me. It is a blessing to have each of you here this evening, each teen here, and of course everyone else. It is uh, important to have people to minister to, otherwise uh, they would just be standing up here <laughs> with me. So thank you for coming, and uh, Youth Night is always an encouragement and a challenge to me. Uh, we're going to continue our study in 2 Kings. Uh, Pastor Spink referred to that a few times this morning. Uh, the continuation, not 2 Kings. Um, and uh, it kind of left us in a little bit of a cliffhanger. And uh, I don't, I want to uh, get us through that. Not get us off the cliff, but uh, go through the, uh, the 13 verses I'm going to try to. One thing I've uh, always... Um, Forgotten is the reading of the text, and I, and I want to do it justice today. So if I could ask you to stand one more time as we read 2 Kings 9 together, 1 through 13. It's a short passage, but uh, if you can, please stand so we can honor God's awesome word. <clears throat> and Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, and take this box of oil in thine hand. And go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there, Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in, and make him arise up from among his brethren, and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil, and pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door, and flee, and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Verse 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. And they said, It is false, tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted, and took every man his garment, and put it under him on the top of the stairs, and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. Thank you for standing, and may God bless the reading of his word. I, uh, the first time I read through this after knowing I had this passage, my first thought was, what? <laughs> it's not, that's not good for someone who's used to reading the Bible either. Um, it's only 13 verses. But this actually concludes and starts a number of things. There's a lot packed into these 13 verses. Like I said, this morning Pastor Spink left us on somewhat of a cliffhanger, and I didn't use ease like he did that time, but um, I will get us through that and explain it. So the one I want to focus on 
in this portion of Scripture, this passage, is one primary thought. And that is, that I should turn on the remote earlier, um, that you're going to have to advance that, Matt. God always fulfills his promises. And that's a very short thought. But it is packed with meaning. God always fulfills his promises. Now, as before I became a parent, a parent, I was told to be careful what you promise. Because a promise is like an oath. It's taken seriously by most people, but especially to a child. If mommy or daddy or whomever, favorite uncle or aunt, promises something, in a child's mind, it's as good as done. And we are God's children, and he has made several specific promises to us, but also to the people in this, these verses and in the previous chapters and books. And we get to see very specifically tonight how God fulfills those promises, which just goes to prove he fulfills all of them, even the ones to us. So in the first three verses, I want to see and show you the commission of a ministry, a call. Now, we've talked through the life of Elijah, how Elisha has taken over from him, even as a mentor to the sons and children of the prophets. And in verse 1, he calls one of the children of the prophets and talks to them. Now, he has a great many of these at his disposable, not that they're disposable, but um, he, we saw in chapters 4 and 6, he spends a considerable amount of time with the group known as the sons or the children of the prophets. And last time we, I did a little explaining about uh, who those people might be and um, that, that him and Elijah had set up uh, not a school but a quasi-training uh, program where these people stuck together and they looked to these prophets, uh, what we will say are more well-known prophets like Elijah and Elisha, for a good example and for a lead. However, we see that they are not the only ones God uses. Elijah and Elisha were used a great many times for God's glory, but we, we've seen that there are some unnamed prophets in previous chapters that are also used and remain unnamed. So we see God can bring glory to himself through many people. And this is one of those people. It says, called one of the children of the prophets. And that, that does not mean he was a child. It means he was a child of the prophets. A ward or a charge, if you will. Not a child. Um, but underneath the order of Elisha. And he calls one of them. They, in um, chapter 6, they actually move regions. They say, the wood over here is better for building. Will you move with us? And prophets were known for going wherever God took them, which was pretty often. So wandering around, but he had an abode with them. So he was with them when he needed one. He called one of those children, and he said to him, so he orders a, a prophet. He calls one. Um, and there, there aren't really uh, degrees that we can tell of where God considers, you know, Elisha uh, a higher prophet or more important or anything like that. He used him a lot. And we have a lot of recordings of God using Elisha. But there aren't, uh, you know, my brother-in-law just joined the National uh, Guard last year, so I've been talking about ranks a little bit more often than normal. Um, you know, there's not private first class or second class or sergeant or captain prophets. That's not how it works. Um, God uses people who are willing. And the man came because he said he talked to him. Verse 2, we see that he gives him uh, the tools to do the errand that he wants. He says, gird up thy loins, take this box of oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. So he gives him a command. 
Usually girding up loins was a reference to speed. They wore, uh, you know, usually knee length skirts for the lack of a better word. And to go quickly or to run quickly, you had to sometimes tuck them up into your belt. So he's saying with speed, go and do this command I'm about to command you. Now, he also calls it a box, although that's not a very good translation. It's more of a container, a flask, if you will. And this was the same kind of flask used to carry oil uh, in that we see in 1 Samuel. A lot of prophets use oil for good reason. Priests, we know why priests use oil. For prophets, it's usually to anoint someone. And that'll make sense in a minute. He says, take this container of oil in your hand and go to a place called Ramoth Gilead. Now, that is a lot like saying go to uh, the Berea of Ohio or the Berea of this county because there's other Bereas in America, right? I once read that there's many different Romes. Uh, there's a Rome in every state is what I read. I think there's a Flint in every state too. I don't know if that one's true or not. But so it'd be like saying going to uh, Ramoth in the region of Gilead. And that, so he has his destination. He has everything he needs to know, to obey his master, to obey God's desire. And there are many times where in life we see God tells us to do things, and some of them are obvious to us. Some of them are a little less obvious, where we have to pray and study for a while to divine what God wants. And some of them are hard, and some of them are easy. But he always gives us the tools to obey. There is no job, no occupation, no command that God gives where he doesn't give us the strength, guidance, and wherewithal to obey with. Now, the tools aren't, aren't nearly as tangible. He had a, a flask of oil. This is our main tool, the light to our path. But God also provided the church for encouragement when we get discouraged, the Holy Spirit to comfort when we sorrow. We are given the tools to obey, just like this young man. And then Elisha goes on to explain the job. Verse 2 says, When you come thither to Ramoth Gilead, look out there, Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and not, not to be confused with some other Jehu, because this morning, remember, we learned that that's, uh, a lot of people had similar names or identical names back then in Israel and Judah, look up Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. So Elisha knew that he would be sitting with a group already. So that's a, a form of prophecy because God revealed that to him. And he knew that it wouldn't be in the inner chamber because he wanted the young prophet to take Jehu there. It says carry. I don't, that's not literal literally carry, to lead him into an inner chamber. So he wants him to do this, and then verse 3, take the container of oil, pour it on his head, and say, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee over Israel. Then open the door, and flee, and tarry not, or don't stay. So he was to uh, sequester this young, this, this uh, commander, Jehu. He was supposed to anoint him uh, this was supposed to be done. This is very interesting. And I, I mentioned this is kind of the end of a portion of a story and also the beginning of one. Part of the end is Elijah was actually commanded to do this before he was taken up back in 1 Kings 21. It was one of three different things Elijah was to do. And this was the last one that Elijah had not uh, managed to accomplish before God took him. So... Elisha got a command from God, and he delegated that to a young prophet. So he was told to sequester his target, anoint him, and flee. And try to remember that uh, those commands, because we see they're not followed quite as strictly as Elisha probably thought they would be. All right, this is a, uh, a map. I always try to include at least one of these. If you, it's not 3D like last month, but up here is Mount Carmel. And if we studied a lot about the Valley of Jezreel last month. And if you remember, the, right about here is where the widow found, uh, found Elisha before he went over uh, to Shunem to resurrect the, the boy. Now, you over here in the region of Gilead, you say Ramoth Gilead. And so his, uh, he sent 
the young man all the way through there, the roads. I know there's a road right here. I don't remember where it goes after that. But uh, over there to um, anoint him. And secondly, I want to see exactly what happens. That was the plan of what was to occur. And this is actually what occurs. The young prophet speaks for the Lord. First, he finds his target. He went right away. It doesn't say he, he uh, stayed at all. He did not dally. He went uh, with his loins girded, and he went to Ramoth Gilead. And he finds it. Verse 4. So the young man, the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting, just like Elisha said they would be. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? Now that implies that they were all of equal standing, or Jehu did not want to give up uh, the um, obviousness of his leadership to the messenger till he discovered what his message was. And the prophet responded, he said, To thee, O captain. So it was revealed to this young man that that person speaking was the one God wanted anointed. doesn't say he had extra ropes on his waist. It doesn't say he had more swords. No, uh, obviously uh, no marks on his shoulders like we do it. Um, but he knew it was him, which is one of the first signs that uh, God also spoke to this young prophet. It wasn't just through Elisha. He was there because Elisha asked him to, but he was there to speak for God. And we see that even more in a moment. He accomplishes his mission. Now remember, this was a job that was given to Elijah uh, that God ended up not wanting to occur quite yet because he ended up taking him instead. But he arose, verse 6, went into the house, poured the oil on his head, and said to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Now, he did what he was told to do. He located who he was to. He took him not on the table where they were dining, right, near the table, but into an inner house and there had uh, performed the sign of anointing, pouring oil over their head. If you remember, that's happened to quite a few kings already. Now this is interesting because in the middle of verse 6, 6b, the young prophet says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. He did not say, Thus saith Elisha the prophet, Thus saith the Lord. He didn't quote his master. Um, when, when two conflicting groups or people come together, especially as messengers or ambassadors, and they're there at the behest of their better or their master, whoever, whoever's boss has the most authority or power wins, right? Well, I am an ambassador from the county. Well, that's great. I mean, you know, that would, that would overpower me because I don't work for the county. But if they were talking to the governor of Ohio, then I think I would know who would win that, that uh, specific uh, fight. If that person went to someone who worked for the federal government, whose boss is bigger, the feds, probably. So he's here, and he does not initiate the name of his earthly master. He communicates the name of his heavenly master. So again, a sign that there are not levels to this, the prophethood. So by whose authority do we speak when we talk to people. Now, this is an excellently taught church now and in the past. So I know that if you were to witness to a friend or a coworker, you would not go to them and say, Well, my pastor says that Jesus loves you. At least I certainly hope you don't. Now, does pastor say that? Yes. <laughs> That's not the point. You don't quote the person in this relationship with less authority. You quote the one closest to the authority that you can manage. And this young prophet knew that the message not only was from the Lord, but he was hearing from the Lord. We already saw proof of that. 
You go to people and you say, God's word, which is God's words, says blank. And you are already standing on the most solid, logical, spiritual foundation available to man. That is why it is so imperative to preach the entire counsel of the word. So nothing gets taken out of context. And the word does not return void. So when we speak, do we invoke our leader's authority? Do we invoke our association's authority? I can't even imagine that. I'm in, involved in the Hebron and going somewhere and saying, well, my superior at the Hebron says that we should all wear green. Who cares? What does God say? You quote the most absolute authority. And if we quote the Bible, we're speaking his words. I just wanted to share this verse as a reminder. 2 Peter 1.21 is one of the most common uh, quoted ones. But it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by, remember how it ends? By the Holy Ghost. The book was not written by men or humans. It was written by the third person of the Trinity. God himself penned the words. That is how we can be confident about who we're quoting when we talk about scripture. That should be very encouraging to you. And it's very fascinating to me that that is what the young prophet decided to do at that time. Okay. Verses 7 through 10, he reaffirms a prophecy. I thought this was a, a new prophecy at first, but with the context of this morning's sermon, I hope you realize in the next few verses, it's not. Verse 7, Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Now, avenge, you can only do after the fact. It's not pre-avenging. There were prophets dead. There was blood spilt. And Jezebel was the guilty party. So that is referring to the past. But this young man is talking to Jehu, the one just anointed, and said, You, you shall smite the house of Ahab thy master. Not Ahab himself. That'd be hard. <laughs> But the house of it, or the, uh, the authority of it, there's many different ways you could interpret that phrase, but literal ancestry, or descendantry, is, excuse me, uh, is, is what he means there. We'll see how that turns out. Verse 8, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I'll cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that shut up and left in Israel. Now, before I get too far ahead, this third point in under here, this wasn't part of the young man's task. If you remember the list, Elisha did not say, anoint him, say a whole lot of stuff about Ahab and prophecy, and then flee. <laughs> he said, anoint him and flee, don't tarry. So th these four verses, this extra chunk, is revelation to that specific young prophet for Jehu's ears to explain what God is doing and why he is doing it. Because if, if you see if you can remember your history, was there already a king on the throne when David was anointed? I heard a lot of sisses, so I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> yes, there was. King Saul. Is there a king already when Jehu is anointed. Yes. Okay. So we are talking about a coup. And considering God had them go to a military commander, this is going to be a military or a violent coup. It's not going to be one of those cool political ones where you trick everyone or lie or whatever. So the young prophet has another word from the Lord. And honestly, this starts the ball rolling, if you will. The prophets have known 
for a while that the house of Ahab is doomed because of their sins. But this is one of the first times that God has had someone act to instigate for a catalyst the coup that will bring about justice. And this is honestly where we get the focus of tonight's message. God does not forget his promises. He does not forget his words, which is why I chose the word fulfill. Ahab's line is destroyed in verse 28. We don't get to that point tonight. When Jehu shoots his son Joram in the back while fleeing. That's the current king. So it does come about shortly thereafter after this passage. With Ahab already dead, the fulfillment of the prophecy in 1 Kings 21 comes about. Ahab was warned, because of your sins, your line is doomed. We will not, I, God speaking, I will not allow you or your descendants to rule. And he did not move against him because of his love for David. But his descendants died and did not rule. Now after this prophecy, the prophet did run away like he was told, finally. Can you imagine? You're already in a lot of stress. You got the military commander away from all his scary looking friends. You got him alone. You dumped the stuff on his head. And then suddenly God says, no, wait. You have to tell him these other four sentences before you're allowed to run away. Just sweating bullets. So we have a God-ordained coup that is coming up. And we see verses 11 through 13. The coup goes from the private knowledge of the prophets who already knew and those they told to a full-blown military uprising. Now it almost doesn't get there because you have the catalyst, Jehu, the new king, anointed king, be reticent about telling his commanders. And we'll see that. First off, uh, they critique the messenger we see in verse 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said to him, Is all well? Is everything okay? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. Now, there's many different meanings for the word mad and this one has a little bit of a crazy flavor to it remember this young man was supposed to I would be very impressed if he ran that entire way although he might have been helped by the Lord for all we know but he had his skirt in his belt he was running into the city and said which was you you know uh, the captain I'm after he did it really fast probably as fast as he could and then he ran away and usually, they're probably used to military messengers coming with messages from the front lines, not prophets. So, they call him mad, crazy, interesting. <laughs> and he said to them, ye know the man and his communication. As in, you've guessed it, he's crazy, and only crazy messages can come from crazy people. And I didn't think that was the interpretation, but you look at verse 12. They insist on more information or different conclusions than what Jehu offers them. They say, no, that's false. It is false. Tell us now. Tell us the truth now. The real story. Okay? You can't have someone we know is a prophet of Elisha's and God's come in here sweating and breathing hard and anoint you and run away and nothing happens. And so he decides to spill the beans, to repeat the story in 12 B, which is when the coup really becomes official, goes from just a leader to followers. So he says, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. So now it goes from a message from God to an action from God. There was an official anointing. There was now a king to be in the same country as a king. That never works out well, by the way. Not for the king. They insisted that he tell them the truth, and he did tell them. Now, we see very interestingly 
And I think it's because Jehu quoted not the prophet, but the Lord. He gave them the Lord's words, which will, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Again, the highest authority possible was quoted. Because they believe him like that. If you look at verse 13, they don't question anymore. They don't say, oh, that sounds like a bad idea because a whole lot of people are going to have to die. They hasted, hurried, and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. So their action, they reacted immediately after verifying the source of the information, the authority of the information, the reliability, and they took off their garments, their coats, whatever they were wearing, and they set it out on a place uh, up above the steps. Remember, they were just in a, a humble house. It might have been an outpost in Ramoth Gilead. Um, and they didn't have a throne, so they just went up to the top step, said, here. And that's what you do with a king. It is saying, the best, the best of what I have to offer and what I possess, what I have on me right now, the best, I mean, the suit's probably the nicest thing I'm wearing. You put it out under them and say, this is for your comfort. I am uh, here to serve you. So they recognize his claim to the throne immediately. And they blew with trumpets, because military people have trumpets laying around, saying, Jehu is king. And that's where that ends. That's where this passage ends. Now, I think one more thing before we conclude, and it's noteworthy that they said Jehu rules as king rather than the traditional proclamation or acclamation is long live the king, right? That lasted all the way up until uh, the British monarchy. Long live the king, or the, the king is dead, long live the king or queen if they were reigning. And it was only made, that phrase was only made when the, the ascent of the full public people, the entire country was made, or the entire country knew and they had won. So they recognized that it wasn't officially official. He had a claim to the throne that was backed up by God, but he did not sit on it yet. That comes later. The actual fulfillment of it and the death of Ahab's descendants comes later. But this is uniquely uh, kind of the end of Elisha's involvement in this. He emerges again later, but the bulk of his work, the, the author chooses to describe as over. He did a lot. If you look at it, actually, well, I won't go back to the map. All those boxes were him or Elijah doing things throughout the country. He protected the company of the prophets, the widow and her family, and even the nation itself, Elisha did. He did much. He modeled the Lord's grace by healing Naaman and convincing Naaman there were no other gods. We looked at that a few weeks ago. And he demonstrated the Lord's sovereignty over political affairs in Judah, Israel, and Syria. There are many people who believe that Israel only deserves or gets to be within its current borders, which aren't are, are very modern, by the way. They're from the last 75 years or so. God had different borders in mind when he promised the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we will see them come into those in uh, the end times. But Elisha demonstrated the Lord's sovereignty. He cared about po politics because political leaders affected religion and how people lived. And we know from all the commands God's given us, as his people, as his children, and as his church, he cares how we live. So what do we take from that interesting narrative about military and prophecy? The first I wanted to take from the situation between Elisha and the young man, and that's to always listen for God's call. We are all called to different ministries. 
I know some people don't consider themselves in ministry because they either don't get paid for it or they don't do it full time. And honestly, that's baloney. Each of us is called to a ministry. The Spirit has gifted each of us with unique gifts to serve the church and to serve Christ. It's imperative that we are keeping our ears to the ground for ways to serve him that complement our gifts. Secondly, is we need to be confident in whose authority we speak. And that person is God's. Now, when we quote God, we better be quoting God in context. Because there is a lot of theological beliefs out there that are based on verses or sentences that aren't taken in context. You need to be careful with that. Being a Berean, a studier of God's word, is extremely imperative to being a mature Christian. But you need to make sure that you're reading in depth. Not just reading. We have a, we have a very uh, clear reading program here throughout the year to get through the Bible in a year. And I would recommend that. But it's not homework to be blasted through. It is something to be cherished as a time of learning. So we can be confident about what God says each time we quote. And lastly, we can be comforted that God always fulfills his promises. Always. And to everyone. For us, we look at the Bible and we don't necessarily see a country that we want back because we're not Jewish or even a king that we want dethroned because we're, we don't have a king and we don't live in a monarchy. But we do see things in our lives that are undesirable, that are difficult to get through. And in that point, we must remember God has made promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always forgive. God is always righteous, which means there's always a punishment for sin. I hold you in my hand and I will never let you go. There are promises we can grasp that will get us through. And not just survive life. God does not just want us to survive this life. He wants us to thrive and give him glory in every action and word that we use imperative why well, uh, I'd love to preach through verse 28 uh, when when all the physical things are fulfilled but leave that to another person so let's close in prayer as we close our service Lord I thank you very much for this evening as we wrap up and I thank you for your word and what an encouragement it is we are grateful for you fulfilling your promises we're grateful to you for making promises to us we didn't deserve it. We uh, sinned against you, not just from birth, but every day. And we are constantly amazed that you desire a relationship with us. And as we think of those from our congregation and families who've passed away, Mark and Phil, we think of the promises that have to do with salvation and eternal life and about being glorified, Father, and how even if everything in this world goes awry, we can rely on you and your promises, Lord. We thank you for that dependability and being a dependable father. In Jesus' name, amen.